So to give you all a little bit of background information, I'm LaShawn Banks, Associate Director of NC Growth. So we were tasked with economic development research in the highest poverty, highest unemployment areas of the state. Fast forward to today, having worked with 75 different businesses, over 23 different communities, we have built a very robust program where we support local government, such as mayors, county commissioners, um, city managers, and also businesses in rural and economically challenged areas. So from this, we realized that there are a lot of strategies that are out there that folks need to learn from each other. So we're excited today to kick off this event. I did want to give a brief shout out to the NC Grove team, which is comprised of myself, Carolyn Freiberger, who is our program manager for economic development, Elizabeth Basnight, who's our program manager for the business projects, Dr. Mark Little, who is our director, and Cara Stiff, who is our newest member of the team, our program coordinator. And with that, I'm actually going to kick it over to Carolyn Freiberger and have her introduce the rest of the team and tell you all what we're doing today. So next, what we're going to do, I'm going to take you through the web tool itself and just show you some of the different functionality. Um, then I'm happy to say we're going to hear from a couple of the towns that are featured in the tool. Um, we have Steve Harrell, who's the town manager of Aden, North Carolina, and Shannon Campbell, who's the economic development planner with Hillsborough, North Carolina, both with us today to talk really from the town's perspective um, about their strategies over the last 10 years and what it means to be included in this, in this set of case studies. And then we're going to invite all the, the partners up um, and the towns to have a, a conversation about the web tool and kind of updates moving forward. Um, we welcome questions from all of you, both in the, on the live stream and in the room. Um, folks that are on the live stream, you can submit a question at any time through the um, comment box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but we'll get to those towards the end of the program uh, during that, that panel discussion. So feel free to submit those questions at any time now. Um, excellent. So we'll just get right into the meat of it here. Um, the URL is homegrowntools.unc.edu, really easy to find. And we have a couple different ways that you can engage with the material on the site. So, you know, often what we see, especially in small towns where there's not necessarily dedicated economic development staff, um, it's, it, we wanted to make this engaging uh, for folks that aren't kind of steeped in the language of, you know, academic, economic development um, terminology all the time. So the first way that you can, you can really engage with the case studies is through this customized results option, which is a brief survey that allows you to um, put in details about your town and what your challenges are, and then it's gonna kick back to you from the, the set of case studies that we have, um, some of the most relevant cases to your town's um, issues. So you can select the population size, um, we'll say we're a mid-sized town, you could have cultural assets and natural beauty as some of your community's biggest strengths. Um, and then outcomes you might like to see, we can look at increasing tourism and perhaps downtown revitalization. We're also asking, um, you know, what is the role of the person that's, that's doing this search? Mostly because we're curious, really, who's using this tool um, and how might we make it better for them in the future. So once you submit that, you get, again, this <coughs> ranking of cases that are most relevant to your town's um, issues or aspirations, as it were, and then more, more results um, as, you, as you want to see them, but you can take them a couple at a time. When you visit a specific case, you'll see at the top we've pulled up to date um, or more recent kind of data snapshot for each community. Um, this is an area that we'll be updating continually and shortly we'll have the new 2017 American Community Survey data um, into this snapshot. Um, and then you'll see some of the top line kind of lessons learned from, from the original case study that was done in the town. Um, the button here will take you to the full PDF of the file and that allows you, this is the original case study that was published in 2008, allows you to see the whole um, study for the town. As we move forward with the site, as I said, we are updating all of these cases, and so we'll be adding in a second document where you can really see, you know, okay, it's been 10 years, is the town still pursuing this strategy or not? Um, and if not, why not? And so for the cases where we have that, 
update, you'll see that um, link right down here. And as I said, um, we've had students working on this and we have some content just waiting in the wings, so I really encourage folks to keep checking back to the site um, over the next few months because we'll be continually adding information. Um, and then as I said, there's a couple other ways you can access the information. One, of course, is to just go um, geographically if there's a specific place you're interested in. And you'll notice there, right now the cases do cover um, much of the United States. There is kind of a, a density in North Carolina for obvious reasons. Um, but as we see seek out new cases, we hope to increase that geographic footprint, um, especially through partnerships with other entities in those, in those places that are really connected to economic development work happening in small towns um, in other parts of the country. And then finally, you can browse by, specifically by strategy. Um, so here, all the cases are grouped by different strategy types. Um, and you can just click on them that way. And then each one, you'll see that has tags. Again, you can click on those tags to get further into those specific strategies. So we hope that it's a way um, for folks that aren't as familiar with economic de development technology, it's a portal into that and a kind of a learning tool where you can see the different strategies and concepts and the way they're um, related. And then for those that are in the field and working with this information more frequently, um, you can go straight to what you're interested in looking at by those strategy tags um, and also the, the specific places. Um, I did I want to just mention the planned updates. We have a couple of new case studies that are um, written up and ready to be added into the tool. Uh, they just need some final design tweaks and then we'll be putting them, them on the site. Um, and one of those actually is Durham, North Carolina. So most of the case studies that you see in the tool now are smaller communities, um, primarily under 100,000 people. But as we, again, uh, seek new content and write up new content, um, we will uh, expand the, the representation in terms of size of municipalities. But we do think there's a special value in gathering case studies of these smaller communities that really have unique challenges when it comes to economic development. Um, other planned updates, again, we will be putting in the um, up-to-date census information for all the cases that we have. And then for all of the North Carolina case studies, we do have updates on those that will be added in. Um, there's now, as of today, there's about four or five that are in there now, and within the coming weeks, that will be up to about 15 cases um, with added information. So again, do check back uh, regularly. And you can also subscribe on the site itself here um, for updates, and we'll let you know uh, what's going on and, and when we're making changes. So with that, um, I'd really like to turn the attention to the um, representatives we have from two of the towns in the case studies now um, and let them talk a bit about the case, the strategies that they've employed, things that have changed, things that have not changed, um, things that have worked, things that have not worked. Um, so I don't know who wants to speak first, but um, welcome to step up to Hello everyone, I'm really yes. glad to be here. I see my friend Kenny Flowers in the audience. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I always like to take an opportunity to talk about the town of Aden. Uh, Aden is a community of about 5,000 and we are located in the Greenville, North Carolina metropolitan area, about six miles from downtown Greenville and uh, in a sister university, ECU. Um, I would like to say I'm glad to be back on campus uh, I am an MPA grad when it used to be called the Institute of Government, that's a long time ago, um, <laughs> and been in the business for 36 years in local government, and I'm very excited about uh, Aiden. I've been there two and a half years, I'm wrapping up my career there, and we're making some great inroads in Aiden. So I'll get right into it. Uh, Aiden was a North Carolina small town program uh, and started back in 2006. That's a part of the North Carolina Main Street program, and at that time, uh, the main coming in, newly coming into the Main Street program, Aiden got um, some some dollars to be able to to do a downtown revitalization study, and they put together essentially a three day charrette, and it was it was staffed by planning planners and economic developers in the Greenville area. We didn't they did not bring in a consultant, and spent three days deciding what would downtown Aiden look like. Uh, downtown Aden is very much like a lot of small towns in eastern North Carolina in particular and has lost a lot of businesses over the years. A lot of buildings are boarded up and closed. And so there was one of the things that we wanted, they wanted to do at that time was to speak to 
the facades, the streetscaping, kind of make it more inviting. So the focus was on facades of the stores, streetscaping, brick crosswalks, trees, park benches, period street lighting and traffic uh, signals, wayfinder signs, where the public parking is, where public buildings are located. Um, they they <clears throat> did some, some envisioning about infill of some vacant lots downtown. Uh, and lastly, spoke about gateway entries, uh, in, in the four ways into downtown Aden. The things that were accomplished since that time is there are brick crosswalks. They're not real brick. They're the stamp into the tar and you paint it. Can't tell the difference. Lasted all these years. Looks great. A period street lighting was put up and period traffic signals. We're fortunate. We are a public power community. We run the electrical system so we could do that in-house and most of the power lines downtown have been removed. So you don't have all of the power lines over it. Uh, hurting the, 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 the looks of downtown. Um, we started a facade grant uh, that pays up 50% of the of improvements to the, street, the storefront facades up to $2,000. And we've had about a half dozen uh, of our storefronts uh, take this on and they look, they look tremendous in, in many cases. Uh, we also spoke about pocket parks and that was part of the plans that were talked about in 2006. Uh, pocket Park to take up some of the alleys we have in our downtown. That's not been accomplished yet, but just this past year, we partnered with the ECU Landscape Architect class, and they've come up with plans for putting in two pocket parks in our downtown, and my town board is committed to funding that for the 1920 fiscal year budget, and we're going to have two really nice downtown po uh, pocket parks. If you've ever been to downtown New Bern, that's what we are thinking about, is the kind of things they've done to their alleys, which is beautiful. Um, we also started in 2000, and, let me back up and say, we have a Main Street Committee that meets monthly. Uh, it's composed of pro uh, merchant owner, merchants, property owners, a couple of my commissioners are on the board, and it's staffed by the town, the town staff. And we wanted to bring some ideas that would bring people to our downtown. That's one of the strategies. We need to get people to come to our downtown. So in the summer of 2017, we started something called Sounds in the Town. We have a really nice stage downtown. And in the month of June, July, and August of 17, <clears throat> we had a beach music night. And those of you, if you're from Eastern North Carolina, you know what beach music, well, if you're my age, you know what beach music is and what shagging <laughs> is. Uh, so we had beach music night. And what we did was, we brought in the local shag club out of Greenville, and we, for the first half hour of the night, we taught shag lessons. And then the next hour and a half was open shagging. We did those three nights in 2017. They were very successful. This past summer, we decided to do a little different. We had sounds in the town, and I brought along with me one of our, one of our posters that we put out. Um, we had, in June, we had another beach night, in July, we had salsa night, and we tapped into our Latino community, and they, just lots of people came downtown. Again, same process. We talk for half an hour, and then you dance for an hour and a half. Then in, in August, we teamed with the Folk Art Society of Greenville, and they came and taught contra dance. We had a live band, and we also had the Greenville um, cloggers come in and do a clogging exhibition for us. For those of you who know anything about, I went to Western Carolina, I know about clogging. Uh, so we had cloggers. And then we, we thought we were done for the, for the year, and we decided to have one more in October, and we had a line dance night, and that turned out a whole lot of people. And we had a line dance instructor, and then we line danced for several hours that night. <clears throat> this summer, we're going to expand it. We're going to start in April, we're going to go through, um, we're going to go through October. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to marry it with an idea that we came up with this past year called Business Open Late Thursday. BOLT, B-O-L-T, is the acronym. We started it in Christmas this past year. And for the all the Thursday nights leading up to Christmas, our businesses downtown agreed to stay open late. And we advertised. And, and then we put food vendors on the street to try and get people to come to downtown Aden who had never been before, and we were going to be open late on Thursdays. 
it was, it was fairly successful. It wasn't as many people as we thought would come, but it, it, did, it did allow us to advertise. So we're going to start Bold Up again in April, and we're going to do it um, two Thursdays every month through the summer, and we decided that we're going to do Sounds in the Town the same night as Bolt. So we'll have open businesses, we're going to have a, a dance, uh, we're going to have food vendors to get people to come to our downtown. This past summer, if I'm going, I'm trying to, okay. Now, this past summer, <laughs> the, board, <laughs> the board adopted a commercial vacant building code. Uh, and what that basically does is it requires property owners to renovate their buildings such that they do not look vacant. And that's the key, to do something with their windows, to do something with their plate glass, to do something so that it doesn't look vacant. I do have to tell you our big success story, and I'm glad Kenny's here today. We have a new business coming downtown Aiden called Quilt Lizzie. She, the, the owner is going to take a two-story 1915 building that used to be Worthington Five and Dime back in the 1930s, and she's going to renovate the entire building with a $500,000 CDBG grant from the Department of Commerce. Thank you very much. Uh, she's, she's matching that with $125,000 of her own money, and she's going to renovate the building to its old 1915 state. It's right in the center of town, folks, and it's going to cause the domino effect. And I found out that quilting in North Carolina is big. I didn't know that, but it's big. Um, she opened her first store in Warrington, population 900, three years ago. Last year, she did over a million dollars in sales in Warrington, North Carolina, population 800. And she's opened a store to Wake Forest. She's got one in Jacksonville, and she's coming to Aiden. And we are very excited, as you can tell, that she's going to come to our downtown. Real quickly, the strategy there was the town owned the building. We, somebody donated it to us. We went out and tried to find some folks. Susan, just the owner, just happened to be coming through town. She was looking to move to Pitt County. She had her manager call me. We showed her the building and got with, with CDB, oh, the Department of Commerce, and we have, a, we have a destination store coming to downtown Aiden. We're very excited. Last thing, we have a US 11 bypass, uh, Southwest bypass will open in November. It's going to connect 264 to 11, and it's going to right there at Aiden. And then it's 11 miles to Kinston. It's going to be, it's going to be interstate quality. And it, what it's going to do is connect us to be eight minutes from the Vidant Medical Center, which is some 6,000 employees. And so we're very excited about the fact that we're now going to be a place where people want to come to live and shop and then go to work in the Greenville area. And it's going to connect 264 and 70, which are both being upgraded to interstate standard. That's it. <laughs> <Wonderful>. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. And since he didn't say it, I'll say it, but it sounds like we should all visit Aiden um, after this presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking to that and calling out some of those specific strategies that the town has used um, in the last few years. And next I'm going to ask um, Ms. Shannon Campbell with Hillsboro to talk about the um, strategies employed in Hillsboro recently. And then use that one there. Thank you all for having me. Steve, that was a lot. That's a lot to follow up. I should have gone first. Uh, my name is Shannon Campbell. I'm the Economic Development Planner for the town of Hillsboro. Um, Hillsboro is not far from here. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to stop on through. Um, it's a great community population, right about 6,500 right now, and growing rapidly. Um, as we've seen Wake County, Durham County, Chatham County start to build out, we're starting to see some of that over in Orange County as well. Um, so we're pretty excited about being um, included in this. Uh, when I was first asked to do the update, I read through the original case study and I was like, wow, so much has changed. I was really surprised because when you think of Hillsborough, you think of Hillsborough not changing at all. It's a 250-year-old town. Um, we have a very large historic district, beautiful houses, but largely it's, it's stayed pre pretty, pretty much the same for 250 years, except that it hasn't. Um, we have a very strong downtown. Um, the town has always been very forward thinking. Um, they really started their economic development strategies, strategies in the early 90s. Um, they are a community that went out, went to the legislature, and um, petitioned for food and beverage tax, which is something that not a whole lot of communities have. That's a 1% tax on prepared food and beverage that goes into our tourism program. 
Um, and they also get 3% of the um, occupancy tax for Orange County. So one of our strategies for economic development, a big one, is tourism. Um, we rely on that pretty heavily. Um, when the original case study was written, we were really promoting heritage-based history tourism, being a 250-year-old town. Um, and we were also managing growth. We were trying to make sure that we didn't grow too fast, too much, all at once, overwhelm our roads and our infrastructure. Um, to fast forward to today, the town is still really forward thinking. In 2015, they did decide to hire somebody full-time for economic development and tourism management, which was a great move on their part. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I got that job. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a good move because with Hillsboro, you know, they don't wait until they have problems. They're a very proactive community. So um, they, you know, things were going great in Hillsboro when they hired somebody for economic development, but they wanted it to be better, which is an awesome approach to take, especially with a small town, because a lot of times what happens is these problems sneak up on us. Um, Hillsboro doesn't have that. In the early 90s, they did a Vision 2010 plan. They updated that. We're on Vision 2030 right now. I imagine we're going to have to start looking at that and get up to Vision 2050 <laughs> at some point soon. But Hillsborough is always looking forward. Um, the downtown is doing great. We're always looking at ways to do better. Um, one of the things when I started that I was looking at is our tourism program was all based around history and heritage, which is great, especially for an old town with such a huge historic district. But Hillsborough has, not everybody is into history. I married a history teacher. It's not really my jam. <laughs> but. <laughs> But I do like outdoor recreation. I went to Appalachian State University, really into the outdoors. And you know, not a lot of people know this, but the Eno River runs right through downtown Hillsboro. But nobody was talking about it. Um, we built the Riverwalk Greenway along the Eno River in Hillsboro in 2014. But for some reason, nobody was talking about it. Um, that portion of the Riverwalk is part of the Mountains to Sea Trail, but nobody was talking about it. So we did diversify our tourism offerings um, to include outdoor recreation. Um, we also have Okanichi Speedway, which is an old NASCAR track that not a lot of people know about, <laughs> not a lot of people talk about. So we're working on that. Um, we've also got a couple of award-winning restaurants. They have awesome co cocktail and beverage programs that really rival downtown Durham, if I do say so myself. Um, <laughs> But so we're starting to talk about that a lot more with our tourism program, and we're also really trying to foster our creative class and our creative community and the arts. Um, we participated in 2016, I believe, in the um, AEP-5, which is Arts and Economic Prosperity Study, and we did that with um, Carborough and Chapel Hill and Orange County overall, and it was shown, which was great to have that data, that every dollar that we put in, we definitely get back. Our return on investment with the arts is huge. Um, we've had a program um, similar to what Steve described called Last Fridays, where our businesses stay open and we have a band in downtown. Since the early 90s, it's huge. Um, we have really tried to foster the arts in our live music community, and it's resulted in um, the location of Yep Rock Records, and Red Eye Worldwide, who um, both have large recording artists, two of which that you may have heard of, the Wood Brothers and Mandolin Orange, and they've both played really big free concerts in Hillsboro, which is kind of cool for a town of 6,500. Um, so we're, we're really proud of that. Um, on the economic development side, you know, we can't just rely on tourism. Um, so what we've really been trying to do is foster our small businesses and our entrepreneurs. Um, that entrepreneurship is not something that Hillsboro really got too involved with until recently, so we're excited to kind of head in that direction. And also trying to do some active um, recruitment and retention. What we were seeing there for a little while was um, businesses would start up, they would get kind of big, they didn't have a whole lot of support, and they would leave us. And, and we, don't want, we don't want that to happen. We want them to grow with us and be able to keep them if, if we're able. So I think that's fine. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> And it, I think next time we'll have to convene this as a, a field trip um, so we can go sample some of these uh, offerings that these communities have to, have to offer. Um, at this point, I'd Good like job. to ask all the panelists to, to join us at the front um, and encourage questions from the audience and from the live stream. Um, and I'll kick us off with some questions as well. And I've been instructed that you all will need to use this handheld mic um, to pass between you. So. 
And as we're getting settled, um, if we could just get introductions from, perhaps first from Jonathan and then from Jeannie as well, since we haven't heard from you yet. So I'm Jonathan Morgan. I'm on the faculty at the School of Government here at UNC, and I specialize in economic development, which means I spend a lot of my time working directly with public officials, uh, many of whom are in some of these smaller, more rural, economically distressed communities that we highlighted in this uh, original case study work, and that we're, I'm glad that we're at the place where we're updating them and, and have a process in place to keep, keep updating and adding to the database. So. I am uh, happy to be here, Jeannie Milliken Bonds with the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Uh, community development is kind of the least known function of the Federal Reserve System, but we work with people, places, small business, and of course the practice and policy of community development. So excited to be part of this. I previously worked at the Rural Center and I'm a WNC grad, so I'm here among family. Wonderful, thank you all for being here. Um, first question I'll put to the panel is just, how will this tool help you or your constituency, and how do you envision it being used um, by the folks that you serve or in your own job? I will tell you that one of the things that I did this past week was I sent out the link for hometown, homegrown tools to our, to our uh, ministry committee and to all of the merchants in our downtown and so that I can get some stakeholder input back. And they're looking at that, and I know that we're going to have a a lot of conversation going on at the Main Street uh, committee meeting next month. So I, I like to encourage our folks in town to be part of our effort rather than it just being staff driven. I think uh, one of the big benefits of, of this body of work is that it provides a place to start for some of these smaller, uh, more rural, economically distressed communities. Uh, in many instances, uh, public officials, leaders in those communities don't know where to begin. And they're overwhelmed by many of the challenges that they're facing. And this database, this uh, sort of compendium of promising practices and potential success stories provides a place for some of these communities to, to begin where they can begin to see some of the possibilities and to get a sense of uh, what's possible, what can potentially be in their own communities because they can read about communities, similar uh, types of communities facing very similar challenges that found ways to press through and overcome the adversity uh, and to, to sort of find a way forward. And I think, you know, there's a sense of when you read through these case studies, if you're one of those communities that if they could do it, uh, so can we. And so I think in many respects, these case studies provide uh, a source of hope and inspiration for some of these smaller, more economically distressed areas. Um, and it gives them some concrete tactics and strategies that may not necessarily be fully replicable in their own communities, but it sort of gives them a sense of what could possibly uh, be done. And so I think that's a, a big value that these, these case studies add for, for public officials and leaders in these communities. Um, how's, okay. um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing right now, especially in small towns, in community and economic development, um, either things that may be currently covered in the tool or, or you know, kind of up and coming topics that we may need to pursue in future case studies, um, updates and additions? You want to go again? <laughs> um, I, I think this is discussed a little bit in some of the case studies, but um, one thing that I'm seeing, and I talked about the arts, is just kind of the creative class and the creative community and folding them into your economic development strategy. Um, you know, Steve talked a little a little bit about it with, uh, with quilting. Um, we've seen it in Hillsborough. We had a new... Um, Reach, uh, merchant retailer come in and she sold fabric and she also did classes and there was this whole kind of maker movement around her shop and 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 she really created something that was really unique and special um, that you can't you can't find you know in Raleigh or in Durham or in Chapel Hill I mean this was a really interesting um, thing that she created and we've always had a lot of um, artists that live in Hillsborough but that kind of reinvigorated that and we started to see even more arts kind of coming to the area because of that. And I think that um, tapping into that creative class and, and tapping into that is something that, that we'll see a little bit more too moving forward. 
Um, so I think a couple of things. I, I think different types of communities have different anchors. So Steve talked about a, a business um, becoming the anchor downtown. It, it might be a college. It might be a community college. You know, it might even be some, it might be a Y or something around a, a community organization. So I, I think that some of those strategies um, users of this tool will find some interesting things among some of the cities. Um, certainly opportunity zones are, are the big conversation. And from meeting with some of the funds, I think those investors are looking for places they can go and find out, oh, is this a zone? Do, what do they have? Is this a place I can invest? And that's really the purpose of it, is to try to drive that investment to communities that aren't, don't already have a pipeline of investment going on. And I think as we add to the tool, um, I think CRA, I have to say this, and uh, the banks will appreciate this, but uh, community reinvestment was intended to be a leverage for other types of funding. So I think that banks, even our examiners, uh, when they're examining a bank, we'll be able to go here and, and look and see what a community has, and it's going to become a great um, reference site for us. So I, I think some of these new trends around innovation and finance are certainly uh, practices um, that will make this tool very relevant and useful. I think that one of the things I picked up at a Main Street Committee, me, uh, Main Street Annual Conference in Clayton last year was trying to find somebody in a small town who is your your champion, uh, somebody who is in the private sector, somebody who speaks for the businesses and, and has the wherewithal to try and do something. And uh, we do have a gentleman um, who has bought two of our buildings downtown just in the last six months um, and is planning to renovate those, rehab those. One of them is a beautiful 6,000 square foot building. He's homegrown. He's a businessman. I, I, I won't use his name because I didn't ask him if I could. Uh, but he is the kind of individual that can, he, when he speaks, people listen, and he's very excited about our downtown. He's a lifelong resident of Aden, and I think he's going to end up being our champion, and that's what I've been told in some other Main Street towns that you need. Uh, it's obvious to me that many small communities are turning to placemaking as a development strategy, uh, sort of echoing with what everyone else is saying. Um, and whether they explicitly refer to it as placemaking um, may not be as important, but if you just drive around North Carolina, you'll, you'll find many communities are doing pieces of, of this placemaking strategy by focusing on their downtown areas, their main streets, uh, trying to identify the aspects of their communities that are distinctive and special that they could more intentionally leverage and build on. Um, and so I think that's a trend that's likely to continue. And um, I've been pleasantly surprised in just sort of driving through some of the small towns in North Carolina where you're like, wow, I didn't realize they were, were doing all this in their Main Street area or in their downtown. And you start seeing the, the, the signs of life and vibrancy returning. Um, and, and there's a bit of a buzz that you, you can feel just in some of these communities. And I think that uh, as more and more communities embrace that strategy of placemaking, uh, we'll see more and more communities taking, taking that up as, as an approach to development. Kind of spinning off of that, I think one of the things that stands out in the case studies um, is really unique partnerships that come to play, especially in small towns uh, where you may not have all the players that you have uh, in a more urban area. So I'm curious if you could speak to some of those unique partnerships that you've seen in your work. Well, um, I'll, I'll take a crack at this and let you <laughs> guys join in. Um, I think that, um, you know, the, there are always very interesting partners in smaller communities. You just have to dig for them. And it might, it, it might be, as someone said, um, you need a quarterback or a champion for a project. So it might be that local business person. It might be the neighborhood group. Um, that's been, um, I, I was once a mayor of a small town, and it was this woman's league um, that had this vision for a piece of an environmental park that kind of grew into a project and actually created an, an environmental park. And that's not necessarily, that was a civic club that we didn't necessarily think to go to um, to work on economic development, but they ended up being a, a major part of it. So I think that partner, you have to do a little digging and um, find out what the talents are of the people in uh, different places and spaces that might be able to contribute to it. And again, I think that's something with this tool 
that in some of these communities you can dig and it'll evoke some ideas that other communities can pursue. Um, <clears throat> as far as unique partnerships, I don't know that these are necessarily unique, but we make great, um, we, we make, we go out of our way to try to partner with our other local government agencies and economic development groups um, in the Pitt County and area. Um, we work very closely with our Mideast Commission. They have an excellent planning department. That is a council of government. There's 11 of them in the state. Um, and they help us to put our application. They wrote our application to the Department of Commerce for the Quilt Lizzie grant. Uh, they're helping us put the application together for the EDA, so we have that partnership. I mentioned that we partner with ECU. We also have a, a, a good partnership and working relationship with, with the Pitt County Community College. Uh, and in addition to that, we have a very close working relationship with the other local governments in the area. The managers in Pitt County, the county manager and the town managers, we get together on a quarterly basis and we talk about what we're doing in our communities and we meet in each one's community and we're supporting each other in that type of a partnership. So just to uh, restate, the, the university, the potential to partner with, with the institutions of higher education, uh, like the universities, the community colleges, uh, those are tremendous partners. Um, if uh, they're, you're proximate, you happen to be a community that's proximate enough to some of those institutions. Um, and then the other, I think, potential partners um, are philanthropic organizations. Um, I've been involved in some work the last few years funded by the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust focused on several distressed communities in North Carolina uh, trying to understand how uh, health outcomes can be improved and how that relates to community development and economic development. And so uh, philanthropic organizations, I think, are, are tremendous potential partners uh, for many of these small communities. Thank you. Um, this question I'll, I'll pose to the panel, but I'm also curious if there's feedback from the room as well. Um, I'm curious what additional features you might like to see in the web tool or additional topics covered um, that would be helpful in, in your work. Is, is Anchor one of the search categories? Thank you. Um, so the question, is Anchor one of the search categories? It's not currently one of the specifically labeled strategies um, working with Anchor institutions. There is, you can of course search, there's a search bar at the top um, that allows a search for that. And I haven't actually tried that search, so I don't know what it would bring up. But um, if there are specific keywords, you can pop that into the search bar. But I would agree that's a great um, topic for future, for future cases. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question uh, was, how are you measuring success with this, and what's a reasonable time frame for measuring success? Um, we have lots of data analytics set up on the back end of this site, which is really exciting to, to see um, just use patterns generally across the site, which pages are people going to. But we're also capturing data from the, the survey tool there and from the searches to see, you know, are there things that people are searching for that we're not covering in the site, or are there trends in um, specific searching for specific strategies or uh, challenges. So that's something that we'll be interested to look at going forward. Yeah. And so that question is, how do you tell the difference in a town like Aden between someone coming to an event versus sustained traffic into the downtown? Um, do you want to take that question? <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure that I could that you could tell the difference. The purpose for the events is to get someone used to coming to our downtown, um, and hopefully that they'll gravitate into becoming customers of our of our retail businesses and our restaurants in our downtown. In addition to that, by having those events. It's going to, in generating that traffic, it's going to generate folks being more interested in trying to, to open something. Um, I, I know for a fact that um, it's, it's a little controversial in a small town, but I know for a fact that we've got somebody looking at us as a possible microbrewery. Um, and there are a number that have opened up in the Pitt County area. So I don't know how you could exactly do that, but I do know that those events are making us a destination and ultimately it's going to be beneficial. 
And I think that speaks to, you know, there's the question of how do we measure success of the tool and then how do we measure success of economic development in small towns. Um, and each of these case studies, they do call out specific outcomes that, that towns have seen in relation to their strategies. Um, some of the things that, that we look at are uh, new businesses created um, and businesses retained, new jobs, um, number of annual events is also something that a lot of the towns talk about and, and attendance at those events. So those are the, some of the outcomes that you'll see just named in the specific case studies. Um, are there any other thoughts there on, on kind of general tracking outcomes of different strategies in small towns? Just going to say um, that's one thing that we're doing in Hillsborough now um, because we have such a big tourism program is we're trying to determine um, for last Fridays if we get what we think is somewhere around three four thousand people into town how many of those are residents versus how many of those are people from Carborough or Chapel Hill or Durham or Raleigh that heard about the event um, and so we're trying to track that a little bit more and I'm not sure if our um, the um, if the current tool has updated contact information for who the best contact. So if you have a question like that, um, if there is information about you know each of us or just a general number for the town, um, that may be something to think about. And then um, I guess I had a question about the tool. And I know we're, this is right now we're kind of at a 10-year update. But are there, are there any plans for future updates and, and what kind of increments we're thinking about for that? Because like I said, when I look back at this 10 years, I, I mean, this was immensely helpful for me to inform my work because you don't have always that institutional knowledge of someone who w was with the town or did originally work on the original case study. I luckily, I luckily still have the same mayor, so he still knows all that stuff. But it was really, yeah, <laughs> but it was really, really eye-opening. There were things that I wouldn't have known otherwise without the case study. So it's great to do that 10-year jump, but may one also consider two, five-year. Two may be aggressive. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that that feedback about the utility of just having that existing case study. Um, but we really see this as a kind of a longitudinal data source. So there's definitely value in having multiple points in time. Um, right now, with this first body of work, you know, we're in those updates now and and should be completed um, within the year with all of the full 44 case studies. And then the next push after that will really be developing the new case studies and adding to the to the body of work. Um, beyond that, I can see probably at more on a five-year or 10-year update while continually adding new case studies all along the way. I mean, one thought, and I don't, I don't have a solution for this, is um, how this tool could be cited in, in other programs that actually bring something to a community. So will they cite homegrown tools as you know, their data source or the source where they acquired this information? We'll have to think about a solution. Um, we have done some of these launches in smaller groups, like with the Rural Center and folks like that. And what continues to come up is, will you ever highlight failures of a town? People always ask that. And that's a really tricky question, right? Because first of all, the town has to be willing to talk about their failure. But the way that we go about that is through the update. So if you look up entrepreneurship strategy, right, and then you go to the update 10 years later and they're now on tourism, then entrepreneurship entrepreneurship may not have worked, but um, that question does come up. So we do encourage you all to play around with this tool. And even maybe some of the towns, if you want to answer to, you know, how you talk about something that didn't work, the way that we plan on capturing it now is these continuous updates. But it is a very, very important issue of, you know, we tried this, it didn't work, but now we moved on to this. So if y'all want to add anything to that, I just wanted to make sure that we captured, you know, some of the non-successes. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. Um, and there are some that I can think of now that, especially with some of the business incubators, they started with one targeting strategy, didn't have success with that, and then shifted that strategy and still have a very successful business incubator, um, but it's not what they thought it was going to be at the beginning. And it's very helpful to, to see those kinds of examples. Um, yeah. With that, I think that we're about at time to wrap up. Um, I did just want to call out, you know, as we move forward with these new updates, we'd really love to hear from all of you if there's um, cases that, that you know of that you think should be featured in the tool. Um, if you have a class that needs to, to write a case study assignment, um, I'd also love to hear from you. Um, partners on developing those are also valuable. So thank you again so much for being here, and, and we hope you'll stay connected with the updates moving forward. Um, we are going to pass around a quick survey just to get your 
your thoughts um, on the tool. And then I hope you'll join us. We have some light refreshments outside and would love to continue the conversation with you there. Thank you all.